Hello, and welcome to part of the continuing series of workshops and seminars to celebrate Cybersecurity Month. This is a panel discussion on the changing cyber landscape in healthcare. This panel will explore the current state of and expected changes to cybersecurity in healthcare. And we will be introducing our panel members after a brief introduction. As you know, this is a challenging time in healthcare. And in addition to an expansion of awareness and concern about infectious disease, the recent pandemic has focused our attention on a number of issues that have, for some, been a com common concern long before the current challenge. One of those areas has been cybersecurity and the vulnerability of our digital platform within the health sector and beyond. The explosive growth of this challenge in terms of frequency, sophistication, and impact has elevated, elevated this issue to the attention of political and economic leadership as well as the general public. In fact, it would appear to be one of the few areas where policymakers across the political spectrum agree on the need for better understanding the dimension of the problem and for coordinating a comprehensive response from a defensive posture to proactive risk mitigation. In healthcare, this issue has moved from one of concern about a brief interference in operational service to one that has major impact on clinical as well as administrative operations. We have already seen how we can fundamentally change on short notice the nature of healthcare services in a region. Evidence is already emerging that this disruption poses actual risk to patients and staff with diversion and delay of critical services and assertions of deaths attributable to these attacks as well. As such, it is not just a threat to property, but also a threat to people. As the digital platform has become a fundamental part of all aspects of healthcare and related sectors, the importance of this challenge has become paramount. The response from the public and private sector has been robust, but it is recognized that there is much to do to secure the safety of the sector and the public. The public-private collaboration between the government and private groups through the Health Services Coordinating Council and Health ISAC play an effective and critical role in that effort. As noted elsewhere in these presentations, this body has supported collaborations that have enhanced our understanding of these issues, as well as sponsoring and guiding initiatives to mitigate risk and raise awareness. We're privileged today to have a diverse panel of experts who bring deep expertise and various perspectives to this issue from the public and private sector. I'm pleased to introduce our panelists and note that they will be speaking for themselves today and the organizations that they represent. First, I would like to introduce our panelists, Maureen Allison, who is a CISO for Johnson & Johnson. Ms. Allison has responsibility for protecting Johnson & Johnson information technology systems and business data worldwide. This includes ensuring that the company's information security posture supports business growth objectives, protects public trust in the Johnson & Johnson brand, and its legal and regulatory requirements. She is a member of the company's compliance committee and presents to the Johnson & Johnson Board of Directors on cybersecurity risk. With more than 260 companies in 60 countries worldwide, Johnson & Johnson is a global leader in consumer health, pharmaceutical products, and medical devices. Prior to joining Johnson & Johnson, Maureen was chief security officer and vice president for Medco, the largest pharmacy benefit manager in the United States, and was responsible for all aspects of the company's security, regulatory, and compliance, including physical and logical security, executive protection, as well as HIPAA, payment card industry, Medicare, and prescription fraud and IT controls. Prior to that, Marine was with Avaya as head of global security, where she worked on securing the World Cup network in Korea and Japan in 2002, and before that, she was Vice President of Loss Prevention and Safety for the Great Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company. Before joining the corporate world, she served as a special agent in the FBI, working on undercover drug operations in Newark, New Jersey, and also working on terrorist bombings in San Diego, California. She developed and participated in the nuclear terrorism exercise, Compass Rose 88, the largest mock terrorism incident ex exercise by the federal government. She has a Bachelor of Science degree from the United States Military Academy at West Point in the first class to include women. She has served in the U.S. Army and the military police at Fort Hood, Texas, Fort Chaffee, Arkansas, and Fort McClellan, Alabama. 
She has served on the Defense Advisory Committee on Women in the Services appointed by the Secretary of Defense and the Overseas Security Advisory Committee appointed by the Secretary of State. Maureen is a founding member of the West Point Women and currently serves on their Board of Directors. And she's also on the Board of Directors for um, HISAC, the Health Information Sharing and Analysis Center, and ASIS International. Our next is Jackie Morrison, Vice President and Chief Technology Risk Officer and Chief Privacy Officer for Southern Health. Ms. Morrison has worked in healthcare for 18 years. For the last 16 years, she has focused primarily on technology risk, information security, and privacy. Currently, Jackie is the Vice President, Chief Technology Risk Officer, Chief Information Security Officer, and Chief Privacy Officer for Sutter Health, where she provides direction and oversight for all facets of the technology risk and information security and privacy program. Prior to this, Jackie served in Chief Privacy Officer roles at Sutter Health and Mayo Clinic. And prior to Mayo, Jackie worked for a pharmacy benefit management and mail order pharmacy company and an independent children's hospital in compliance, privacy and information security roles. Jackie is considered a subject matter expert and leader in technology risk, information security and privacy and has been recognized by Becker's Hospital Report as top 20 CISO and CPO to know in healthcare. She is a member of the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics and the co-chair of the Privacy Committee. Coincidentally, an Information Security Subcommittee. Uh, previously, Jackie served as a member of HHS's Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Task Force and serves as both an advisor to boards and startups. She has testified before government and legislative committees, authored numerous articles, been quoted in books and articles, and is a frequent national speaker on these subjects. Jackie has a Juris Doctor from Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. She holds certifications in healthcare law, privacy, information security, and compliance. She has a Bachelor of Arts with Honors from the College of St. Scholastica in Psychology. Welcome, Dr. Monston. Uh, Nina Alley, Executive Director, Biohacking Village. Nina has over 16 years of experience in biotechnology biomedical and security with a focus of healthcare. Her work in healthcare has seen her deal with the complexities of modernization of complex legacy systems within the healthcare industry, and this included but not limited to infrastructure, legacy system integration, and electronic healthcare records. Nina remains an active researcher in the space of threat modeling, cybersecurity, and a special interest in the safety and protection of patients and the care they receive. She is also the executive director for one of the biohacking villages, which has grown to be one of the largest villages to partake in DEF CON, which is held every year in Las Vegas. Nina is instrumental in many projects that has seen medical device manufacturers work in conjunction with researchers to develop new approaches to address the security within medical devices and healthcare. She places and supports the biohacking community to have the hard conversation and push the healthcare forward. And I am Ruben Pasternak. I am a physician. Um, I'm a member of the panel whose expertise is not specifically in cybersecurity, but as a clinician and as a healthcare executive, one of those who has had to learn from the outside more of the sophistication and the intricacies of cybersecurity and information systems. Uh, my background is in critical care and anesthesiology. I was on the faculty at Johns Hopkins for 20 years where I was vice dean, and my research was in threat system analysis for clinical and operational activities and developing mitigation programs for those before going into the private sector where I served as a chief executive officer for hospitals and executive vice president for health systems in Ohio, Virginia, and New York. So I am delighted to be with these colleagues today to learn from them. And I would like to start with the first question. And the first question is in the area of supply chain. Jumping right in, let's start with a wide lens on the ecosystem as a whole. Earlier today, we heard the top cyber executives of Apple and GM talk about the need to secure their supply chains. But we know the complexity of the supply chain is daunting. At CISA, we look to maximize our impact by seeking out what we call ball bearing companies, critical partners in the supply chain. As an example, while working in support of Operation Warp Speed, 
CISA reviewed over 800 companies and identified entities whose size and scope would normally not draw attention. Nonetheless, they were critical as they provided a service or substance essential for vaccine development. We dug these ball bearings and by providing support that they otherwise would have lacked, we were able to protect a crucial part of the supply chain. This is one of several examples where entities separate from but associated with the main enterprise could result in risk. So the first question we have is, can you share your perspective on security challenges within the supply chain and hopefully some insights into solutions? Maureen, why don't we start with you? Well, thank you very much, Reuven. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, as we've seen in healthcare, and, and I think HIPAA uh, probably was one of the very first regulations that really, I mean, I think SOX did it too, Sarbanes-Oxley, but really looked at the business associate. So you had the, you know, the protected entity, and then you had a business associate. So we in healthcare have look, been looking at our third party suppliers. But one of the things that's particularly different than GM or Apple is we actually share data with our supply chains um, for human health care. And, and, and we together, not just one entity. So if I'm working, if j j is working with a, a hospital, we both have responsibilities around the protection of that data. Our, our third party suppliers, we, and, and again, I, lo I love the term ball bearings, but it's not ball bearings. These are people. So in healthcare, our supply chain is a completely different supply chain. Yeah, we have some of the things, if I'm making Band-Aids, I definitely have, do I have the elastic bandages and do I have all of those things to make it? But the delivery of healthcare in the United States, is a shared responsibility not only among those who create products, but it's also those service providers, doctors, and, and even some small, very small physicians' offices um, that are responsible all the way. The end to end supply chain includes the patient in our area. Very good. So, so Maureen, as you have done this, what are some of the challenges you've had working with some, and you work with a large number uh, of other organizations in terms of being able to make them more aware of uh, issues, concerns, and suggestions? Um, you know, like most uh, large companies, we have a third party risk uh, uh, capability where we assess our suppliers and some of our suppliers it'd be easy to say oh you pass or you fail but in a lot of instances what the small suppliers provide is so unique um, you have to actually work with the suppliers to help them uh, be able to understand that the risk that they now have and work with them additionally um, i'm on the board of directors of the h isac um, the health isac um, and, and sharing of information around threats, uh, working together on common uh, issues, looking what I'll call supply chain choke points. That's some of the things that we found uh, through Operation Warp Speed, that areas that you might not think could be choke points, but to identify them and then ensure that those companies um, have, have and understand uh, the risk that they're about ready to enter into and then help them develop the programs that are necessary. Thank you. Um, Nina, I'd like to go to you and get your perspective on some of this, given your uh, very different place in, in the healthcare community. So I love Marine and I love everything you just said. I have some additional things. Um, the VAAs were really hard to enforce prior to um, the pandemic, and they're even harder to assess and direct now. And just going along with that, um, patient data is the premier for everyone involved and invested in healthcare. Along with that goes, where is this data being held? And physically, where is it being held? And then the numbers, the data, where is that? So where are the servers? 
being made and where are they being held? If we're a lot of the manufacturing for servers and chips and, and that full stack, right, are not made in the United States. So we are asking other people to manufacture those things for us and then put our data on there. And we are not assessing what their security risk is and how they are producing those things so that we can make better decisions, better choices by putting that data in there. So it becomes a bit of a um, convoluted situation where we have to be more in depth with our contracts and with our conversations and with how we have expectations of how security should work. And Nina, I believe an area of interest for you is also as people are dealing with legacy software and the challenges of, of how you make a transfer in your system to a more secure system and uh, and the technical and, and financial challenges associated with that. So it's fun facts. Um, most people have more than one EMR, right? Because they went from a legacy system to a new system and they have to keep that legacy system up because of whatever information might still live there. And I think for children, you have to keep it until they're 18 or 21. So that still has to live there. Are we updating those systems appropriately just as much as we're updating these new ones? Healthcare is traditionally not um, very resource heavy, right? We are resource poor generically. So how are we competing with other industries that have $75 million to spend on their security when we are still just fluctuating between what is what is best case scenario for the money that we do have? Okay, difficult challenge. So Jackie, I'm gonna to swing to you and you get a twofer here because I'd like you to respond to this question, but also to the uh, to the next question, but what are your thoughts on what we've been talking about so far? So I think we're always going to have issues with third parties. Um, you know, we are unique in healthcare in the sense that we have a lot of complexities and we all surround a patient. But I also think uh, we've been making meaningful progress. And so one of the things that I'm excited about is we finally got an exception for st the Stark and Anna kickback regulation that allowed us at Sutter Health to be able to provide our independent physicians who we share mutual patients with uh, the basic cyber hygiene technology to better protect them. And I think personally, uh, we've seen a lot of complexity with the interoperability rule and now information blocking where you know, everything wants to be electronic, um, yet we weren't ready for that as a healthcare ecosystem. And so this is an example of us really having the opportunity to bridge that gap and at least give the basic cyber hygiene that I think if every one of our third parties had, we'd be in a much better place today uh, than we actually are. Very good. Um, so going on from there on the clinical track, and you probably sit in the in the space closest to where I was before coming into my interim role here at CISA. Um, we discussed the supply chains, materials and services. Now let's talk about the people as in fact Maureen was directing us to at the very beginning. When cyber disruptions of any nature occur in clinical systems, we not only see issues in operations, but in clinical service as well. Vulnerabilities exist in so many different portions of the care setting and securing systems is a formidable challenge that also requires active participation of all teams. When you're tasked with not only ensuring operations for a large system of hospitals, but with the delivery of care at the patient level, how do you strike this balance? What are the challenges you face? Jackie? Yeah, so I think patient safety is always number one, um, both you know providing the best care possible and keeping them safe. And so that's the center of everything my team does. That's what I wake up thinking about in the morning. That's what I go to bed thinking about. And, um, you know, security surrounds that. And so what we're looking for is a risk management approach and how do we mitigate as much risk as we can uh, proactively? And then how do we also be ready to respond uh, to particular incidents, knowing that we're not going to have um, the same security that a bank might have? Um, because if we have that level of security, you know, the physician might not be able to operate on the patient. And so that's really how we surround and look at it is from a risk management approach. And uh, it's not perfect and it's always challenging. Even something like as simple as a patch, uh, we have to make sure those are appropriately tested to see what's going to happen with that technology. For example, if it's a biomed device, um, you know, we're not just going to deploy that patch blindly. Uh, we're going to see what happens with the device um, because that device could be implanted in a patient. It could be used to deliver meds to a patient. And so it's it's complicated. Um, and I think we just you know focus on surrounding our patients and uh, making the best risk management decision that we can uh, with the facts that we have at the time. 
Yeah, Ruben, uh, Ruben yeah, I just wanted to add in there is it's, you know, before it was, I would deliver products to the back door of Jackie's hospitals. And it was a clear, okay, I'm responsible here to there. Today in the digital world, the connected world that revolves around patient care and patient data, we now have a shared responsibility. I think this is one of the areas where uh, the FDA and HHS have taken a very active role to help us in healthcare security, where if you look at, and I call it the internet of healthcare things, medical devices, and, and Jackie's hospitals have tons of those. Um, and, I, and my organization uh, creates a lot of those. It's those requirements that are in there around increased security around the application, bill of materials, uh, pen testing, the networks, and all of that now has moved to an, a higher level. We're working together with the United States government, with Homeland Security, HHS, and FDA has been a partnership that's helped um, secure the, the healthcare ecosystem. Thank you, Maureen. It's, and I want to uh, uh, give some more emphasis to that because we've seen even in the last uh, two years especially, an acceleration of that collaboration. And as you say, as we've worked on uh, Operation Warp Speed, as you have as well, we learned that uh, the, the chain extended from the research bench to injection and that any drop in that continuous line was a threat and that even internal in the, in the government that we had to get all the agencies to work together, which has been one of the uh, good side effects also. Nina, your thoughts on that? So previously, we know that the devices are secured in silos, and when they get to the hospital, they are then secured in that network, which created a, a bit of a kerfuffle because it was how do we how do we surround this with security with the rest of the things that we have? Um, and I think something that we forget because we're so invested in the healthcare side of everything is that there are micro sectors of the other infrastructure, the critical infrastructures in the hospitals. So if something happens in um, a tunnel somewhere and electricity goes out, does that impact the hospital? How does the water um, situation happen? So keeping those channels of communication open with what happened over here, does it impact us in any way? And if it impacts, how do we work together to bypass all of this, to go around the disruption? Precisely. And, and the, the risk infrastructure that you're describing is something that that has been recognized as, as a major initiative for us as well. So like you say, if there's a problem with, uh, with drivers to transport oxygen to hospitals, the hospitals are affected or electricity or an environmental impact uh, as well. So we're all subject to climate change um, issues too. I'm gonna in, uh, take a moderator's prerogative here and have a follow-up question to this because 20 years ago, we introduced quality as a major issue. And it took a long time to bring that into the culture of healthcare as something that doesn't sit on the outside of operations, but to embed it into the mindset of what we do um, and still work to be done. What are the challenges you've had and, and advice you have in terms of having the people you work with understand that cybersecurity is a critical part of what, of what you do to protect patients and protect operations? Jackie, the very like first, oh. okay. Go ahead, Jack. go ahead, Nina. Nina, go ahead. Um, all right, the, the thing that I was going to say is, is you know, Ruben, you, you bring up something that's very near and dear to my heart. And I think that um, the regulatory um, can go down a channel, a, a channel of being compliant. And sometimes it was compliant to a world that no longer exists. But as companies have evolved um, and looking at the cyber challenge, working with those. So at Johnson & Johnson, um, we work very closely with our regulatory and they created a cybersecurity quality SOP. So it became a part. So if you look at GAMP, there's always been something called security management in the middle of the GAMP uh, uh, books on how you should apply quality to your technology. Uh, but what you'll find is 
it, you needed to make it more robust around today's digital world and how technology is 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 created and used in our medical devices, in our medical products, software as a medical device. The world changed. And, and I think that the companies that have worked closely where security and privacy and quality are, are you know, three peas in a pod, um, actually um, come together and realize how can we uh, change for our company's future, the working together. Now, I, I would say that because we have quality processes it's actually helped us. Uh, data integrity, not only is it part of our security CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, but integrity is a huge quality principle. Back up and restore. And when you look at companies that are, are have a large GXP or quality environment, they're spending, they already were well ahead in ensuring they had backup and restore, which helped reduce the, uh, the plane for ransomware. Maybe some tweaks on air gapping and, and some new technologies had to go in. But I, I contend that quality with security and privacy, the data protection elements all together have the same mission. And when you bring the missions together, you get unexpected good outcomes for the quality of healthcare. Thank you. Nina, you were going to uh, come in as well. So I explain this as a patient experience to people. So you go to your general practitioner, they do the test for you. You have to go for the, the laboratory tests. You go back, you get your results, and then you have to follow up with a specialist, and then they do the test, and then you have to follow up for results. There's a lot of different ways to do the same thing where the patient just needs a diagnosis, right? All of healthcare is under duress, and it's kind of the same with the hospitals because we're going through the processes, and those take time. When we're putting in the devices, the hospital's clinics are 24 hour, seven day a week, 366, 65 day organisms that are constantly moving. So we are putting, we are trying to implement things in something that doesn't have a wait time. We have to do this in real time while things are moving, while patients are still at the end of this cycle. Okay, thank you. Jackie? You know, I think quality is important to everything we do. And so um, a long time ago, we, really started focusing on patient safety, which quality is a part of that, um, you know, including privacy and security. And so if you, you know, hear the CEO of Sutter Health talk, um, she includes privacy and security in that. I would love to see us um, focus on that across all of healthcare, not just, um, you know, some big companies uh, that have all the resources, but everybody see it the same way. So that when we're thinking about providing the best care possible, possible to a patient, that includes their safety, that includes privacy and security, and we got it embedded in the design. And we focused a lot of effort um, over the last several years in privacy and security by design to make sure that if we're doing something, that we're contemplating that as a part of the quality of care. And I would love to see uh, the ecosystem do more of that uh, because that's part of what I think we need is to think about the problem in a different way. Because when you think about, you know, everybody cares about taking the best care possible of a patient, right? And safety is number one, that's never a question. But when you embed privacy and security in it, that's when people um, don't necessarily buy into that idea and methodology. And I think if we did buy into that idea and methodology, there would be no question about even a small system investing what is needed for basic cyber hygiene because they care about patient safety. Thank you. And you mentioned small system, which actually takes us to uh, the next question. And Nina, it's something that you mentioned. You talked about uh, cyber poor uh, entities. We call them target rich cyber poor. Um, and obviously large healthcare systems aren't the only ones who are concerned with this. We need to consider the small and rural hospitals, individual practitioners, clinics, and primary care practices. And these are the type of entities that usually don't have that depth of cyber expertise available on the budget and find it difficult to require, to acquire. And it's not that they don't recognize the importance of it, it's simply having the resources to be able to commit to what they know needs to be had. So they're laser, laser focused on providing patient care and don't have those resources, yet they still present a tempting target for criminals and other bad actors. 
So is this a fair portrayal of what's going on? And how do you reach out to entities like this? And when and when do you and do that? And how can you help? And how can we help as well? So Nina, I'll put that question to you and ask the others to join. Sure. So I'm going to talk about the biohacking village. So it's been around for seven years and every year we grow it more to be more like the actual healthcare biosystem that the ecosystem that exists. So we have a medical device lab where the manufacturers come in and they bring their devices and they ask the hacker community to um, find any vulnerabilities and they're disclosed there. We also have speaking lab where people come in and talk about the emerging threats that they have found. We have a catalyst lab for hands-on learning for hardware. Um, we do tabletop exercises to failure. We go all the way through and um, we also have a capture the flag. So anybody that doesn't have any experience with cyber at all can level up and go into the recreated dark web that we have. So what we have tried to do is show people not necessarily what an optimal environment would look like, but how to get how to level up in your environment. And by bringing in the manufacturers, we are telling people we they have the trust in us in the hacker community to bring their devices to show up and let us get in there and help them fix the things that need to be worked on. Jackie, your thoughts on that? You're on the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, you know, uh, we we have uh, lots of interconnection with small providers and with small clinical offices and you know, they are thrilled that we are able to provide them, you know, the basic sort of cyber hygiene technology that we have over the last year. Um, but I also think that we have to look at the problem differently, as I mentioned before. And uh, a hospital wouldn't run without a radiology imaging machine. And so at what point are we going to think about the security and privacy issue in the context of the patient and say, OK, what do we absolutely need for basic security controls? Uh, and as a hospital or a healthcare system or a small clinic practice, we have to get used to investing in those things to have basic cyber hygiene. We've seen with the COVID pandemic that uh, healthcare has just become more susceptible and easy target for hackers. We've now seen, you know, a, a, an actual United States death associated with a cyber ransomware issue. And so I think, you know, in my opinion, the problem has gotten way too serious if we actually have patients dying from cybersecurity. And so we have to think about the problem differently. And we really do have to invest regardless of how um, the size is. This is part of doing business. And we have to look at the problem that way versus, you know, I'm a small hospital and I can't afford it. Um, they wouldn't operate without a radiology imaging machine and they would figure out how to get one. And so I think they need to do the same thing with basic cyber hygiene. And it's our role as large providers or large parts of the ecosystem to help as much as we can. Um, but I, I would like to see us looking at the problem a little differently than we do today. OK, you've actually given us a nice segue to the next question, but I don't want to go there before giving Marina a chance to uh, to weigh in on this as well. Marina, any comments to add? <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna make it real simple. Is have a security official. So HIPAA requires that a company name a security official. Unfortunately, HIPAA is only around protected health information and can tend to be very narrow. And they take out most doctors or dentist's office or ophthalmology office that are under a certain size. Um, the idea of having someone and and I think GDPR with their data protection officer or Korea or even China with the requirements around a security official are spot on. Once somebody is responsible for security and, and, and it could be even a contract person for, you know, maybe 10 doctor's offices have one, one security official that they utilize or contract with a company for it. You will then start getting the information in black and white on a piece of paper or email that says you may want to look at these things. As soon as people understand what the risk is, um, what I have found is once a doctor or a doctor's office or a small hospital understands what the problem is and the potentiality of what could happen in the cyber world, they make the changes. Because as we've discussed, they're extremely concerned with patient safety and the delivery of health care. And so we look at our customer, our patient, 
And when we bring that back, this is now live safety. Um, you will see a different change. So mine's easy. Security official. Boom. You do that, people start looking at it. Can I add Anything that? you want to add? Yes. So in 2017, there were 629 different standards from the American Hospital Association that had to be um, done. They were laws, rules, regulations, procedures, standards, audit metrics, and procedures that had to be um, focused on by the hospitals to be compliant. And that was in 2017 before all of these things happened, before security was a really big deal, before operation warp speed. So where does that leave us now? Additionally, um, I love the doctors and risk comment that Rune brought up. It's once the doctors understand that the risk it will be on them because they have to make very good decisions for their patient under duress with information that hopefully is right. They will start being more cognizant about this and they will start demanding better from the hospital itself and from the device manufacturers. And Nina, I want to go back to to one of your original comments on this when you talked about what the what the village brings, the biohacking village. And and note that one of the initiatives that, that we've had uh, collaboratively in the public private sector, especially since our, our new director has come on as well, Jenny Eastley, she's been very strong on this topic, obviously, is that um, we form some common ground with our private sector colleagues in terms of what is the message, what's the advice we have, what are the standards we have, and also what are the tools we have available as uh, CISA also has the ability to offer services to some of these organizations free of charge to do an initial assessment and suggest tools and sometimes refer people to a private entity that may be in the best position to help them. So thank you for your work in that regard. And this is a major thrust that we have as well, too. So I have a lot of interest in your public private partnerships as well, because I've had conversations about how we can also bring people to do more with your resources. Okay, excellent. Thank you. We look forward to continuing to work with you on that. So uh, going on to impacts on patient care, and Jackie has already taken us into a lot of this because cybersecurity can feel pretty abstract. We talk about data stolen, revenue lost, but it's not abstract when we talk about lives at stake. And we have recently in CISA released an analysis on pandemic-induced hospital strain and its impact on excess deaths non-COVID-19 deaths caused by conditions whose management may be time sensitive, such as cardiac, neurologic, pulmonary oncology, stroke, and so forth. And the study found that cyber disruption can make matters worse. Analysis showed that hospitals affected by cyber incidents can achieve dangerous levels of hospital strain faster and can stay at those levels longer, further contributing to excess deaths. And we certainly have seen this in recent events over the last year. So this isn't just about hindering operations, it's about disruptions to patient care. Um, it's, life and a, it's a life and limb issue. So uh, I'm curious to see if you're seeing the same trend, an increasing non-digital impact on patients. Um, Jackie, I'm seeing you're not in agreement, so we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, any patient death attached to cyber is, is too, you know, one is too many, in my opinion. And I think now that we are seeing the data supporting this previously we hadn't seen data that really supported the idea that if a hospital or system was impacted by ransomware or malware whatever the cyber issue is that it actually creates patient safety issues and that nicely correlates the data but i again focus on you know if we've got safety issues we need to actually deal with the root cause which is the cybersecurity issues uh, needing to have basic security controls and I, I think, um, you know, and I hope that that case uh, scares people. Um, the the one that recently happened in Alabama, because um, we really do need to take it seriously and we really do need to focus on patient safety. And, um, and I think, you know, a lot of systems don't have the resources to necessarily drill before. And so when you're in a real live cyber issue where you've got all these situations, you know, with the clinical leaders, you have to decide what to do with patients. And I'm not sure that most systems have drilled in such a way that they're actually contemplating moving patients to a different system to make sure that they're receiving the best care possible. But we should be because we rely now on technology to save lives every day. And if our technology is not working uh, because we have a cyber issue or it's just not available, 
the first thing we should be doing is looking at what we should do with our patients and whether we need to transport them someplace else because they're not going to get the best care that they need. And so I, I um, would like to see more of that in our incident response plans uh, than probably previously contemplated because that is the seriousness of this issue. And I, again, just hope that, um, you know, it scares everybody in healthcare to think about how we really need to um, do the basic cybersecurity controls, whether it's a security person, as Maureen said, um, it doesn't matter to me as long as we actually have the basic controls in place and understand the seriousness that if we do get into an incident response, that you're actually thinking of the safety of the patient at that point in time and deciding what to do with that patient, knowing that you don't likely have all of the information you need to actually take care of the patient. So just as we have emergency responses to, uh, to major episodes of trauma, to environmental events and others, you're saying we need to have a well orchestrated and rehearsed plan for a cyber incident as well. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, and, and Ruben, I would say that, and I'm gonna take it back to your very first question around the supply chain. And when you look at all the instrumentation, all of the devices, whether they're directly related <clears throat> to patient care or ancillary, you know, when you start talking about electrical systems and, and backup systems and even how the cafeteria runs, <clears throat> excuse me, what you will find is, do we have a bill of materials? And if anything, you know, uh, the um, solar winds and they called it the supply chain. And I, I think all of us in security kind of went, yeah, we've been dealing this with this forever. It's the what is the bill of materials of that that off the shelf software you have? What's in it? Is it made up of you know open source? Is it vulnerable? Who's looking at it? What's the responsibility if you sell this software? And for us in healthcare, um, we're looking at okay, what is what are the component pieces in these devices? But it's not you know just the medical devices that are classified by the FDA that are important. It's a whole list of other devices that we purchase. Uh, and, and even some of our common, even our email software, you know, if it goes down and, and you're on a cloud-based system, can you recover? How will you communicate? It gets into the term that I call cyber resiliency. And so that supply chain thing becomes a multi-dimensional faceted problem, uh, the kind of the Rubik's cube of security. And then how are you gonna manage the risk in your environment to ensure you're resilient for patient safety. Very good, Nina. So I always bring it back to what are we learning from the other industries that have already gone through this? Yes. And I don't think we're broadening the conversation enough to bring everyone in because we've we've kind of put our heads down and trying to come up with solutions together. And some of the comments before, so uh, my father was a fire, he wasn't a firefighter, he was a paramedic for FDNY during 9-11, and all the comms were down, all the communications were down. So the EMTs and the paramedics had to make decisions on the spot about where people were going to go and if they were going to survive, things like that. So the hospitals already have those um, parameters in place. When it comes to cyber incidents and how they affect people, I don't necessarily those studies were done prior. They, I think mm -hmm. the, the data exists, but I don't think it was knowledge acknowledged that, oh, was did this pacemaker not do what it was supposed to do? And that's what this, that's why this person um, had this outcome. So is it that now we become more cognizant of everything and we are doing more research and being more um, investigatory with the devices and the risks that we're going through or should you know how does how does this play out for future state we are making decisions under duress we have to also look at what is going to happen in the future yes and and, and change our practices now I think to 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 that point a point that Marie made every thing that happens within next to and outside the hospital has an impact so uh, any de uh, device that we bring in uh, presents a potential risk from the time it's manufactured to the time that it comes in. And as I look now about how much of the care we provide 
depends on having digital contact with devices in the home and, and to which uh, individuals have access. How do we protect the individual as well as protecting the system in which they occur? And that, that's a, um, an extraordinary issue that we have to master. So looking to the future, um, we're in a bit of a collective rust spot right now. Our adversaries are changing and becoming more sophisticated. It seems the more we learn about them, the more they're able to change their techniques to adopt. Uh, we remain a target rich environment, which is increasingly digitally dependent. Uh, digital technology presents extraordinary opportunities, but also challenges. And the impacts of attacks are getting ever closer to the physical well being of patients. These are broad swaths of our industry, and some of our, our industry is not prepared for this. And when you consider that healthcare is uh, really close to a quarter of our economy, the extent to which this has an impact on the security of our country is, uh, is extraordinary. So what then does the future hold? What changes do we expect to see in the industry? And maybe more importantly, what changes are needed and how can our audience have helped? Um, I would add to that, how do you see the public sector, the government sector, in terms of being able to assist along with the private sector. So we'll go back to our original sequence. And Maureen, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ruben. I, I appreciate you kidding me first. Um, you know, it, that's kind of a um, almost a philosophical uh, question. And there is a lot that's happening in that space. Um, I, I don't know if you consider the uh, Congress and the Senate uh, uh, part of the government, or you're talking about the government agencies. Um, but I think there's a lot of legislation is out there. Um, I I like legislation because it's helped in some areas, but I also am um, concerned with some of it. Uh, if you look at the privacy laws, um, having 50 state privacy laws is not going to help us protect data. Uh, it's likely going to make it far more confusing, and we still haven't looked at what requirements do we need. Um, we have some good frameworks already put in place. Those of us that are SEC companies um, are already um, under the purview of some of the work of John Warner and reporting of material events. So uh, there's the Porter bill around incidents um, and reporting of incidents um, that's out there. I, I think we, the CISOs are all kind of like, OK, what are you going to want? And then how are we going to give it to you? Emails, probably not the best way to send you a list of my incidents uh, that I had you know, this, this week, this month, this year. So I, I think there's a lot of good going on there, but working with advisory committees and CISOs of small and middle and even some practitioners from you know from doctors offices to listen what is the art of the possible to put in place and then look at uh, the the health um, the health critical infrastructure has been redefined, I think, uh, over 10 times since it was created under the Patriot Act. And at that, <clears throat> the very first initial was around hospitals and hospitals response to a disaster like 9-11. And, and I think we have frameworks. We need to tweak them, whether it be Sarbanes-Oxley and how the governance reporting to boards of directors and how that could work. Is it NIST or HIPAA or Graham Leach Bliley or or the California Privacy uh, California Consumer Privacy Act? Which is it, uh, so that companies can have a level of assurance around cyber that reaches what we need in healthcare around protecting um, not only our company interests, but more importantly, our patients and how we deliver healthcare in the United States. Very good. Jackie, your thoughts? Yeah, I think in the last probably six months, I've seen more resources and more good conversation around cybersecurity than I have in the last several years and meaningful progress, which makes me hopeful. And, you know, that's from CISA and other government agencies, as well as just the industry focus. I think over the last couple of years, we've been really focused on the COVID pandemic as healthcare. Uh, we've been focused on trying to financially recover from the impact of that. 
And, um, you know, so there still needs to be, in my opinion, a prioritization of cybersecurity from all of healthcare, not just parts of it. And then I think we need some regulatory intervention. I think, you know, the HIPAA security rule as an example is all based on risk and it's subjective. And I think we need something less subjective that says, here's the basic controls that you need. And maybe it goes back to what Maureen said, at having a security official. Um, but I want basic cyber hygiene too uh, in that requirement so that there's no question about what is uh, at the minimum is needed, what the floor is. And in my opinion, in security, we don't even have the floor. We have lots of different competing interests. And, um, and then I think I really like the idea of incentives. I think, you know, we've seen interoperability adopt in like, what, two or three years. And it was all because of the incentives attached to it. And mm -hmm. so I think about, you know, is there a place here to adopt that same model to focus resources on cybersecurity to get, you know, the small providers who might not have their own resources available, incentivize them to actually add basic cybersecurity controls to maybe replace that 25-year-old um, radiology imaging machine that's never going to have the standard build of materials for security. Um, so those are the types of things that I think about are, um, you know, things that I'd like to see move quicker than it's moving. And then I think we've got to have more accountability on third parties. Um, it's such a different conversation depending on the vendor who we might deal with as to how important security is or not. And still, every single day, my team escalates issues to me where our, you know, largest supply chain vendor doesn't have multi-factor authentication. And to me, that shouldn't even be a conversation, but yet it has to still be a conversation. And so those are the areas that I think we we have a, a future focus that need to uh, include those. Nina, you get last word on this question. Oh, dear. So I feel like I <laughs> to pull from, from a couple of the things. I am a big proponent of virtual CISOs because they bring in different expertise and they can come in and have the conversation with whatever healthcare is doing and help re-engage already tired people to do the things that are required. Um, I also think there need to be more researchers slash hackers in the government because we have other resources that may not be um, at top of mind for a lot of folks and that should be in healthcare, in biomed and in biomanufacturing. Um, the FDA, I think it was three years ago, had brought about this idea of SIMSAB's um, Cyber Medical Strategic Advisory Board, and I had um, talked about perhaps bringing in the hacker community or bringing in um, researchers into that, and it was under the FDA, but I, I think it might need to be moved under the um, executive office or HHS so that they can help regulate and bring about that one layer of this is what we're looking for, this is what we need, this is how you should do it, et cetera, that standardization. And also the, the White House is starting to develop a Bill of Rights to protect data-driven technology abuses. So I think there's a lot of movement that's currently being made in the government to help push healthcare forward and move us into a better place. I think it just needs to be put into a very nice package that is very readable, that is not um, subjective um, for people to read and we can all get through. Very much so. And I would note to your point of having people come into the government with that expertise, the head of the um, CISA task force um, on this has been led by uh, Josh Corman. I believe you know him and uh, he was involved in, in that providing support from the private side and biohacking with Here Comes a Cavalry. So He's been a colleague with whom I've enjoyed working and I've enjoyed his leadership in this uh, in that effort as well. Well, before we say goodbye to each other, I do have a question and unfortunately time won't allow a lengthy response. But as we talk about these changes and looking at what is going to come in healthcare once the pandemic, I won't say totally recedes, but at least is at manageable levels. Um, obviously, we're not going back to status quo ante in healthcare. And as we emerge from this, we have a lot of challenges we face. How we retain and recruit staff um, that we lost and, and are very tired. Um, how we deal with other aspects of infrastructure that might have been deferred while we had to deal with the immediacy of having our population survive. A host of issues to which now we have cybersecurity uh, concerns as well and needs for that. How do you see all of these together changing the fundamental structure 
of, of healthcare. Do you see this as something that's going to require us to really rethink how health systems are developed, uh, the extent to which smaller hospitals or rural hospitals can survive as self-sustaining entities or how they align themselves with others? Uh, I would be interested in your thoughts. I know that's a little bit of an unfair end question, but, uh, but anything that you could provide in terms of some thoughts to us. Nina, would you like to go first? You represented that spectrum of the, of the smaller institutions that are challenged. It's because you knew yeah. I was looking it up. Um, so the American Society for Healthcare Engineering wrote a paper, I think it was two or three years ago, and they built security into the hospital layer by layer, floor by floor. And um, I am going to be helping them revamp that. I think that yeah. is something that would be very beneficial for a future state of things. I also think that healthcare at home because it is now a thing, makes for a more valuable visit with the patients and the physician. Okay. Jackie? You know, I think it, uh, the pandemic and recovering from it is going to continue to be a challenge in the healthcare system. I do think we gonna, we're going to see more systems partner together and or merge because of the financial viability, just given the impact. Sutter Health, which is a large organization, had a $2 billion loss in the first six months of the pandemic, and we're still recovering from it. And it's included impacts to my team um, because, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, we all have to contribute to, um, you know, what kind of cuts happen when. And so in my opinion, I think we're, we just still have a lot of dynamics to face in healthcare. And um, we just need to make sure that cyber is one of those priorities and that we continued focused energy on it. And I really, really like the idea of incentives because that might help us um, push it where we need to go, given the financial challenges in the landscape that we're currently dealing with. Hey, thank you. And Marie, last comment uh, before we close for the day. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm excited about the future. We are going to move out of, you know, uh, hey, I, I saw the mainframe and Rack F and saw us move into a distributed environment and then the rise of the mobile and the, and, and the, the cell phone and what we've seen. The pandemic, if it did anything for technology, is it made us realize we cannot ignore the digital world. Digital starts with a D, which equates to data. That data, the data of our patients, um, wearable devices, providing more information to doctors in the delivery of health care is going to change. Now, I do realize there are parts of this nation where delivery might be actually even on the back uh, the back of a Jeep. Um, some of our Native American res reservations because of COVID and, and looking at how it would cause complications. We as a nation, as we look at how healthcare, and, and I'm not going to get into a universal healthcare decision, I'm talking about healthcare delivery. We have to look at the humanity that we give our health care to. Health care for humanity. And as we propel into the, this digital world, there will be responsibility for us to help move um, uh, parts of the world, and not just the U.S., and not just rural U.S., or inner city U.S., into yes. these new capabilities so that we can faster, better, cheaper, diagnose and deliver better health care. In security, we're going to have to be right there with our practitioners and help them understand the potential data risks, cyber risks, 5G risks. And people want to make them scary. There are also opportunities to go faster, better, cheaper for better health care for humanity. So I think it's an opportunity that we should seize and not be afraid of. We were afraid of voice over IP back in the day. <laughs> we wouldn't be having this call today without voice over IP. So let's seize it and help uh, health care for humanity. Thank you. Those, those are great comments and thoughts. And I, I want to share your perspective that I think there's, there's cause for a lot of optimism, um, even with all that we've gone through in the last two years. As, as a lot of us have noted, coming into the pandemic, 
we were already experiencing major issues with resiliency um, in so many parts of healthcare, and we were providing sometimes patchwork fixes to try and keep that going and hard to engage. Um, and some systems such as Jackie's were really charging ahead to address it in a more comprehensive manner. But I think as we come out now, we're recognizing that what we need to do is to rethink on a larger scale what we do and how we do it. And this is the chance for cyber to be part of that mix and, and to be woven into it now at the start of that redo as well. So I think that's going to be part of some uh, needed and beneficial and wonderful changes and listening to our panelists today um, and knowing that there are others out there as well, so many dedicated to this, that there's a lot of talent to bring to this um, in the private and public sector and that our job is to get them together and do what we know can be done. So I want to thank our panelists today. You've been great and uh, wish everybody a good day and enjoy the rest of the meetings from Cybersecurity Month. Thank you.